Hi guys, Lyndon here and welcome to the very first Poskit podcast, or Poscast as it's becoming known on social media. Uh, this very first podcast was actually born after a telephone conversation between myself and Llewellyn Pavey at Break Magazine. Uh, we thought it'd be really great to discuss the topic of building the ultimate adventure bike. So much so, we wanted to share it with both of our followers um, and subscribers on Patreon. So we filmed this podcast and we released it as a joint podcast uh, between myself and Llewellyn uh, to all of our Patreon subscribers. But while I was doing it, I realized that actually there's so many different topics that I would like to discuss with so many different people, with different experiences in different things all around the world, uh, that I would start my own podcast series. And that's where the Poskit podcast came from. So without further ado, let's get on with this first episode. We've got another one coming with Walter Kolbach from Sabursky Extreme and many more after that. And the topics are far and wide, racing, travel, lifestyle, many different things. I think you're gonna really enjoy them. So let's get this first one underway and I hope you enjoy it and you'll listen to more following on from it. Cheers. Okay, I believe we are live. Um, awesome. Yeah, sweet. So welcome to the Break Magazine podcast. This is something we normally do for Patreon only subscribers, but today we're going to do a live cast for our subscribers and for Lyndon's subscribers as well. Um, and the point of today's podcast is to talk about building the perfect adventure bike. And I don't think there's anyone better suited to doing that than Lyndon Poskett. For those of you that don't know who he is, oh, I've... He is uh, an adventure rider and rally racer who's been traveling the world since for a long time now. Um, you finished Dakar three times. You finished on the podium of the Malmoto class twice, I believe. Traveled around the world with your Races to Places documentary series. And I think more importantly for the point of this podcast, you've built one of the most unique bespoke adventure bikes that anyone has ever built for this purpose. It's kind of been the center, one of the center points of your adventure documentary series, your bike Basil. Mm -hmm. And it started life as a KTM 690 rally and has been tweaked and transformed over the period of you traveling around the world. But before we get into that, I'd like to kind of find out how you started riding adventure bikes. Uh, yeah, well, I've been riding motorcycles since I was... Uh... 10 years old, uh, ridden many, many different disciplines, but really the thing that triggered my adventure motorcycling, I guess you could say career now, <laughs> um, was when I moved to the States in 2005 and I bought myself a KTM 950 Adventure. And I was living in the US and I traveled a lot. And that's really how I got into adventure riding. I got onto the forum adventurerider.com um, and it just went from there, really. Uh, I never raced any rally races at that point. I was just adventure riding my KTM, and that's that's the point that I got into it. Oh, okay, so how how many how long did you use that bike for? What did you kind of do with it? I've still got it today. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I got it in 2005, so like 15 years ago. Um, it's done 100,000 miles, so about 160,000 kilometers. Um, been around the world on it, not not like I did on my world trip, but on the trip here and the trip there. And, you know, I've been to many continents and different places on it. And I rode it through like 38 of the 48 lower states um, in the US and just explored on it, really. And um, that was the platform that really got me into adventure biking and taking my tent with me and camping and maximizing my vacation stroke holidays and just traveling and adventure riding. So. Awesome. So I, I watched your video that you put out a few weeks ago on Basil, um, yep. which is your, your kind of si your 690 Rally KTM. Yep. And for me, the that bike has seen so much development. It's kind of mind blowing. Like even the engine is not really a 690 engine anymore. So where did that idea of using a 690 Rally for that trip comes from? Because it kind of seems yep. like a mammoth task to turn a rally bike into an adventure bike, you know? Like there's no yeah. products for it or anything. Yeah, exactly. And um, they're also quite unique and hard to get hold of and expensive. And there was a whole list of things that t troubles to get over to start with. But uh, how it worked was I, after adventure riding for years and racing the 950 a little bit as well, uh, I 
ultimately decided to do my first Dakar. Uh, and you know how that goes because you've also done one. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, decided to do, stupidly, decided to do my first Dakar. Um, but, but changed my life, as you know it does. It's massive. Yeah. And uh, to do it, I decided, I looked at all the options, and the cheaper option is to use an Enduro bike with a kit on it. But being an aerospace engineer as a profession, which was my profession, um, I know how important it is to have the right tool for the job, you know, and how important it is that the thing is designed properly and the thought process has gone through properly. You can't just bolt something to it and expect it to work. Like you've got to put some thought about how it's bolted to it. Will it last the duration and things like that? And when I raced the Dakar in 2013, I used a factory rally bike and the bike was so strong, so reliable handled well, carried the weight well and the extra fuel and everything, carried me well. And I just decided that this would be a really good platform because it's lighter than the 950 Adventure that I'm used to. Mm. But the 450 Rally was the perfect platform. The size of it was great for me. I'm six foot two, six foot three. Um, the size of it was good. The only thing I didn't really like about it was the 450cc engine which the Dakar Rally has the 450 limit, uh, loved the engine for racing, but as soon as you add another 30, 40, 50 kilograms of stuff to the bike, a 450 is a lax torque. So yeah. it, it's slow to get away from the mark, it's slow to pull you out of a situation with luggage on it. And traveling around the world, obviously I was gonna have a lot of luggage with me um, in my, my house basically for, for a year so more. Um, so that was where the concept came from. The 450 Rally, but I wanted a bigger engine. Um, the 690 was out, and a lot of people were converting the 690 Enduro to an adventure bike by bolting kits on it and all this kind of stuff. Um, I rode one. I didn't particularly like the fuel injection on it. I found it jerky. Uh, it wasn't easy in technical situations. I didn't like the gearbox, really high first gear, low sixth gear. Just didn't. I just wrote all the things down that I didn't like about the 450 Rally and the 690 Enduro and all the things I did like about them. And the engine in the 690 Rally was what I wanted, but the chassis on the 450 Rally was what I wanted. And I just said, you know what? I'm just gonna build my own adventure bike for this trip because I know what I want. I'm an engineer, I can make it work. Let's get going. And I just decided, went right through it and um, made all the changes and modifications. Not all of them straight away. Some of them I did on the journey as well. So it was an iterative process, but um, that's basically how it came about. Cool. So when you, when you started that build, did you have a list of priorities or was it kind of a case of building some panniers and yep. then trying to figure out the rest on the way? Yes, yeah, so priorities were getting the chassis reliable, um, making sure that I didn't have a broken frame or something break on the bike, or I just put luggage on the rear nylon fuel tank and the fuel tank broke. You know, everything, I had to do the right things from a strength point of view to make the bike reliable. Um, the performance parts, like the gearbox and the engine and the upgrades and the camshaft and all that, I knew I wanted to do, but I didn't have time to do it. Because I only, from the moment I decided to go on my world trip to the moment that I left was four months. So I had four months to design and build the bike. So it was like, it was a little bit touch and go if I'd get it all done. So I decided to just put a standard engine in. So that took away all the necessity to yeah. like make all those parts and design and modify all the bits and stuff. So I just set off on my trip with a standard 654 engine, actually, the very early 690 mm -hmm. engines. Um, that's what I started my trip with. And, so, uh, so with that build, did you start with a, f a new 450 Rally and put a second an engine in it, or no? So the 450 Rally, uh, the first generation 450 Rally, is exactly the same chassis as the 690 Rally. Yeah. So I knew that the 690 engine would fit inside that chassis because all they did is modified the engine to 450 engine to fit in the 690 chassis, mm -hmm. more or less. Don't get me wrong, like there's changes to the chassis as well, bracketry and some little minor changes here and there that makes it so it's not that easy. But you can actually just put a 450 engine in a 690 rally or even a 690 Enduro for that matter. Or you can put the 690 engine in the Mark 1 450 rally. Um, so my bike actually started out as a 690 rally because as I started to research it, I, re I actually found a used one, super cheap. 
and it was trashed. It was like all the nuts and bolts were rusty on it, being used for riding around London on the street with all the salt and everything. Yeah, it was it was wrecked, but it was cheap. And I thought, well, at least that'll save me having to like um, re-engineer the engine fitting into the chassis. I can just use that, you know? So I took that, but everything else from the 450, like the fuel tanks, um, I took from the 450. Uh, and a lot of other things as well. So I tried to make, make the bike as light and as strong as possible. That was the priority. Get the things done to fix it from the bat. Uh, and I still had some small problems. I had the frame footrest hanger break in Mongolia, those that have watched my videos. And But, it, you know, nothing ever goes straight forward. But the idea was to get the strength in everything first um, and then set out on the trip and the other stuff I can do as I go along. Okay, cool. So I think one of the biggest question marks that we see around our YouTube channel, especially, is the cost of adventure bikes. Like people bulk at even sometimes the cost of something like a ten or a seven hundred. You know, it's less than ten grand. So, was the cost for you ever like a big issue with the six ninety, or was it kind of like, no, that's the right bike. That's I'm going to figure that bit out afterwards. I think that it boils down to that I could do everything myself. I had a workshop at home. Um, my dad's an engineer. He's got lathes, milling machines and everything. I knew what I needed to do and I knew I could do it myself. So um, in terms of cost, when you're not paying someone hourly rates, mm. to do something that's very bespoke and designing new parts, for example, like gearboxes or uh, clutches and things like that. Um, if you can do a lot of it yourself and the design work and uh, improvement work yourself, then it doesn't cost that much money. It's just your own time. Mm. Uh, I, I don't even want to think about how many hours went into it, but um, basically the bike, you know, I bought the bike for less than a new Tenere. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was trashed and it looked a mess. Like I've, I've got some pictures somewhere. I should definitely try and find the pictures of when I bought it. Um, and nearly everything was like reworked, sandblasted, powder coated, new nuts and bolts, rebuilt, whatever. Uh, even the engine, I put a fresh engine in it. I didn't use the same engine. Um, but the, the actual cost of me building that bike was not that great. Um, what's happened now though is that you cannot find, they only made about 300 690 rallies and you cannot find them on the market. And if you do, Everyone thinks they're an, I don't know why, but everyone thinks they're this amazing adventure bike. <laughs> and the price the price of them has gone up. So even if you find a standard 690 Rally with no modifications by me, you, you can pay up to 20,000 euros for one with yeah. nothing. So, yeah. um, and then you've got all the time and the cost of the parts to make it really adventure worthy. So they are getting expensive um, as a build. Now, when I did my own, it wasn't so much so. Uh, but that said, if I look at how much I spent on upgrading my 950, the suspension, um, you know, parts on it, making it reliable and everything else, um, then for sure I could have a 690 rally for that price. And when I look at the handling, well, you know, because you've raced a 450 rally, when you look at the handling of a rally bike and the way that it handles and the way it carries weight so low down, um, there's no comparison. So you can never make a production bike feel the same as a rally bike. It's a different chassis, it's it's just different. So um, I think that's where there was always a desire to make it work uh, and I didn't think about the cost too much, but you know, we've, we have built, I think 28 bikes now. So there's still a market very small, very niche because of the price, but the people that are buying them generally have had a 1250 GS, 1200 GS, they've had an 1190, they've had a 10 A or something else, you know, they've had a 690 Enduro even, and they've spent so much money switching between bikes. Mm. And then they come to me and they say, well, I know I want a bike that's like dry 160 kilos, and I want a bike that has sort of 70, 80 horsepower. There's nothing on the market that mm. marks that, so I want one of these. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's the, the biggest decision, obviously, is the money. Yeah. So. so are you getting to the point with that bike where finding engines is now difficult? 
engines is not a problem now because um, pretty much, as you said earlier, with the engine, the engine is completely reworked. So, in fact, we can build an engine from parts basically now, um, from scratch, brand new, um, which we do on our new bikes now. So, uh, and we put all our, we basically we only use the lower engine cases off the 690 and the outer engine covers uh, and the cylinder head and uh, everything else inside is different or modified or changed or new components so um the whole engine is a is a quite a different beast to a production bike okay cool so i think one of the most interesting things about the the 690 rally bike as an adventure bike for me is that i think one of the things people don't talk about very much with rally bikes is that they're not very easy to ride. If you're a no. good rider in difficult scenarios, you can be in charge of it and dominate it. But if you're not, they eat you alive. And you see it every year in Dakar where the wrong people ride those bikes and they don't finish because they're, no. they're just a bit difficult to ride if you're not in charge of them. So yeah. if you don't have that skill, it probably doesn't make an ideal travel bike. So when it comes to helping people choose their ideal yeah. travel bike, where what would you say their kind of characteristics yeah. should be? So the way I would explain this to everybody, if you put the same capabilities of the factory rally bike into a production bike, let's pick a bike, for example, like let's pick the Tenere just because, okay? My bike's got 32 litres of fuel, and if you ride it respectfully, which I very rarely do, but if you do ride it respectfully, then you'll probably get easily 600 kilometers um so if you add the the extra fuel to a production bike yeah extra, to give you that capacity this is just one example the fuel um then you're already pushing the weight right up there so even on a standard production bike mm -hmm. you would be getting to the same weight of a rally bike uh, well, you'd be way over if you had like a twin cylinder bike. If you had a single cylinder, you'd be similar weight. Um, so when you start pushing the weight up by bolting on capability that the rally bike has, you then push the production bike also beyond the capability of the rider because it's so much heavier. Mm -hmm. So, the, but weight is really interesting to me because if I, I loved the bike that I rode, it was great. Um, but with 50 kilograms of luggage and 30 liters of fuel on board i'm thinking a number off the top of my head but it's 235 kilos yeah fully loaded but as you know for a fully loaded bike that's not actually that much no, compared not. to some bikes you get up there mm. but my advice to anybody would be weight is definitely your enemy like if you can get it down get it down like <laughs> i mean you if you want to ride in technical situations the ones that you just talked about like you can get into trouble on a rally bike in then you should be on something like an EXC or, you know, a CRF 450L or something like that yeah. because they're much easier to handle. And also you shouldn't have 50, 50 kilograms of luggage with you. <laughs> so, you know, 15 kilograms of my luggage was spare parts. Yeah. And I hardly ever used it. Yeah. But the times that I did need it, I wasn't sorry to have it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And it's different when you're, when you're traveling around the world. You really need to think about that, especially when you're on your own. Yeah, well, I think especially uh, once you get but, out of Europe, right? Yeah. Um, so weight is definitely an enemy. Um, one massive consideration, which was probably one of the things right at the top of the list for me, was reliability. Um, and it's often what people overlook um, because they think if I buy a new bike, I get a reliable bike because I've got three years warranty. And uh, But in actual fact, when I look at all the newer bikes that I've had and any problems that I've had with them, it's way more than I've had in total on my 690 Rally um, because it's very simple. It's got a carburetor. It's got a very simple wiring loom, um, easy to diagnose faults and problems with out in the field where I don't need a technician with a laptop to plug it in and fix it. I don't need expertise to be able to change. For example, I don't need to change an injector if it gets blocked. Um, you know, yes, I need to know how a carburetor works, uh, but they're all pretty much the same. So yeah. um, it's, it's horses for courses. Like I think a lot of people um, and majority of people watching this podcast will be in the situation where they have to buy a production bike because they don't have the money to buy something bespoke 
and they probably don't have the mechanical wherewithal to buy an old bike with old technology and make it reliable for their trip. Mm -hmm. So they, they would just go to the dealer and buy a new bike. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of really good bikes out there. You know, I've, I've ridden pretty much all of them. Um, and there's a lot of really good ones, none of which I would choose if I was to go on a trip again. But still, there's some good bikes out there. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and yeah, you know, I think weight is certainly the, probably one of the biggest considerations. So once you get to that point where you've decided on your bike, where should someone go next? Like the classic approach for the typical kind of adventure biker is to buy some panniers, bolt on some Turatec protection or some other yeah. brand and yeah, well, kind of what would your priorities be in that scenario? Yeah. Here's another thing that a lot of people don't think about, uh, as well. So you, you think, yeah, I want to go light because I want to be able to do more on the bike. A lighter bike always has a lighter chassis and a less strong chassis. And, the more, and then you start to bolt bits onto a lighter bike, especially if you bolt significant on, if you're going on a big trip or something, and you put bars and protection and more stuff and a nav tower maybe or some you know extra fuel, and the bike was never designed for it. So we see it time and time again at Dakar, and you know as well, you, they buy an EXC, they put a rear tank on it, they put a big front tank on it, they put a nav tower and a fairing on it, the fairing and nav tower starts to fall off, the subframe breaks because there were extra weight from the fuel tank, and it just wasn't built for it. And that's where the rally bike comes into its own because it was built to carry loads of fuel over the harshest terrain. Mm -hmm. And typically production bikes are not built for that. Mm -hmm. um, they're not built for riding beastly fast over really rough terrain, which is what I like to do. Yeah. Uh, so, but for, you know, that's an, a consideration you need to make. Yeah, you'd buy a bike, then you put panties on it. But for me, if I, if I was to ride something like a CRF 450L, I'd be traveling super light. Like I probably wouldn't even, I'd try and figure out a way not to put pannier rails on it, mm -hmm. you know, and I'd use some small panniers like the Enduristan blizzards, the small ones that just like teardrop panniers. Um, and try to travel super light. I probably wouldn't take many spares with me um, and stuff like that. So it's a different approach. Um, each each bike is different in so many ways. Same as I would, I still enjoy riding my KTM 950 and I would still put some panniers on it and go on a one week trip tomorrow with a passenger on the back because it's a great bike. Mm -hmm. So I think the most important thing, and I said it at the end of my video that I did about my bike build, um, don't think that you need to go out and change your bike to go and do the adventure bike you want to do. Quite often, you can achieve really great things with what you've got. Um, and I get um, on the website, I do a, on my website, I do a like consultation for an hour where you have you can have a chat with me about what bike you want to buy. So many people come to me on that. We sit down for an hour, and they're talking about getting a 790 adventure because they want to go on a travel or a Tenere 700 and they sat at home with a WR450 Yamaha or something like that and I'm like but you only want to go on a five day ride that's 1500 kilometers take your 450 it's perfect for that yeah you know I'm like yeah. it really is you're not commuting to work on it you want to go on an adventure ride and you've got a 450 and you don't need much luggage with you what are you waiting for? Yeah, and you're always in charge of it, I suppose. Exactly. You know, it's always exactly. within your comfort zone. Yeah. So I think one of the most interesting things I've heard you talk about, and you really touched on it in your um, your video about Basil, is suspension. And I think more specifically, the conversation about how much you change your suspension between race mode and travel mode, how much your spring rates go up. And yeah. for most people, when they get an adventure bike, it's not something they think a lot about. They just put more weight on a stock bike. So mm. for you, what should their priorities be if they're changing the suspension on their bike or they're building a travel bike? Yeah, it's it, suspension is a difficult one. It's a difficult one to get right. But I'll, I'll share some principles that I used when building my bikes. And I would still use the same principles if I had a production bike today. The biggest mistake people make is that what you said, they don't do anything with the suspension. They literally just bolt everything onto it and go riding. The springs are very soft in production bikes typically uh, because they're built for comfort on the road. Uh, and when you get off road with soft springs and heavy bikes and soft valving, it's a recipe for disaster. The forks are bottoming out, um, the rear shocks bottoming out. You know, we, you guys that follow 
a lot of forums and stuff, you'll see frames breaking, rear trailing arms breaking on the GSs, 690s snapping the yokes off the frames. I can almost guarantee you that that is nearly always suspension that's caused that. A lack of suspension, heavy hit, suspension bottoms out, the load can go nowhere but through the components. And that's when stuff starts going wrong. My bike is essentially the frame on the 690 Rally is very similar to the 690 Enduro. It's done 234,000 kilometers. I've never seen or experienced a crack in it or anything. Um, it's got really good suspension in the bike and it very rarely bottoms out. So I think one important thing to do is make sure that you've got your spring rate set right. That's something that's easy to do. Valving's a little bit different, but if you just get your spring rate right and you sag, then you'll be a lot closer to where you want to be than doing nothing. So there comes another challenge because a lot of people use their bike for two things. So they trail ride it on a weekend with their mates and then they put luggage on it and they go traveling. So, and they don't want to take the shock out and change the spring. So, and that's the same issue I had where I was racing the bike and then the day after the race finished, I was putting 50 kilograms of luggage on it and carrying on. Um, and with my trip, and I can't do that with the same spring. So I had to change the spring. You can compromise though, you don't have to. And what I would recommend is that they either fit an adjustable preload ring um, so that they can, and they've got to pick something, they'll never get the perfect, perfect solution, but they've got to pick a spring in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, not good for one or good for the other, just pick a spring in the middle, and then it'll be slightly too stiff when you've not got the luggage and it'll be slightly too soft when you haven't, but you can compensate with the, with the preload. Yeah. Um, so that, that's one thing that I would recommend is getting the spring rate right um, for what you're doing. And if you are doing both and it's a 50-50, make a compromise. Get something that's in between and then just adjust your sag to get the geometry of the bike right and you'll be good to go. Cool. I suppose in that same point, you kind of have the conversation about weight as well of not carrying too much because the less you carry, the less you yeah. need to kind of up your spring rate. Yeah. yeah. And also the more the more weight you put on it and the more load you put through the suspension, the more likely you are to have failures on the road. Mm-hmm. That's, I mean, the, you know, think about um, a bike with a linkage on the shock. You know, it's one of the most heavily loaded areas of a motorcycle and also the most neglected neglected in terms of maintenance because it's hard to get to and grease. Yeah. And that just, it's a disaster, recipe for disaster, overloading it, um, lack of maintenance, and it fails. Yeah. And then, you know, you, you're stuck, so. <laughs> I noticed in your video, one of the, the nicest little touches I saw was that you'd gone kind of gone old school and put grease nipples on the yeah. edge. Yeah, everything. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I've even done bikes with grease nipples on the headstock. Yeah, you know, so okay, yeah. It's the head bearings and stuff, and um, it's it is a bit old school. Like you say, it's like having a tractor. Yeah. But when you when you're riding a bike on a world trip like I was, you ride it every day. Yeah. It becomes a chore to change your oil every ten thousand kilometers because you're changing your oil once a month. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, it becomes a chore. So everything you can do to make it easier you do it and i was just like i don't want to take i to change to grease the linkage on my bike and a 690 for example you've got to take the luggage off the luggage rack off lift the rear tank up take every the shock out get it all out strip it down i mean it's it, literally it's like a day's work really yeah, yeah. Uh, and so i just i redesigned it all uh, and all our bikes now come with that because nobody wants to do it so take that away from people and the only reason the production bikes don't do that in my mind is after sales and producibility Mm -hmm. because it it adds cost to the production of it to put grease nipples on it and it reduces the need for people to buy spares so why would they do it they want to keep the cost low make it cheap as possible people don't service it and they sell after sale parts so I see why they don't do it, um, but it is a really good modification, probably one of the better ones. <laughs> so would you do it on your Enduro bike as well? I, I, have, I have done it before. I haven't on this one, but I have done it before. But I've got, um, I did 100,000 kilometers without even taking it out. I didn't even take the swing arm or the linkage out. Cool. Just did 100,000 kilometers straight riding and racing without even touching it. Fair play, All right. <laughs> so let's talk kind of fuel range. Um, you crossed the Simpson Desert on your own a few years ago and there's a fantastic photo I'll put it up now of you with a whole load of extra fuel bolted on your bike like it looked like a nightmare um yeah there we go and 
yeah, so what realistically, what fuel distance do you think you need to be able to cover just for a general trip, you know, not talking so, crossing, you know, a 600K desert on your own? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I see the picture now. Nice. <laughs> um, basically, I'm a little bit extreme. So I like to do some, I like to challenge myself and I like to get out onto remote places. So, but if I was honest, like I said, my bike does probably 400 miles, 600 kilometers um, to a set of tanks riding normally, you know, less if you ride harder, um, more if you ride less hard. Um, so that was enough apart from maybe five, so a handful of times on my trip. So if you remove those extreme ones and the ones that I can think of was um, Dudesacker in, uh, which is Death Acre in English, uh, riding the, the remote ride uh, in Angola, which some people might know about. It's uh, That was like nearly 700 kilometers, I think. Um, and Simpson Desert, 505. I can't remember if it was miles or kilometers. Right, must have been sand the whole way as well. Hey? must have been miles as well because it's because uh, otherwise I wouldn't have taken so much fuel. Um, yeah, so Dudesaka must be... Yeah, it's more like 700 miles, sorry, not kilometers. Yeah, uh, because I'll tell you how much fuel I took. So that's all soft as well. Simpson Desert soft, 505 miles, I believe. Um, someone will correct us if I'm wrong. Um, the Canal Heritage Trail in Canada um, that I did, uh, and a couple of other times. So five, five times uh, on my trip um, that I had to carry extra fuel. So let's talk about Simpson Desert because you've got that up and you put the picture up. Um, 505 miles, all sand, uh, the sand highway, as I call it, it's quite a well-ridden road. So it's not, it's not like, I mean, they say it's like 1500 parallel dunes, but they're just rollers. They're not like yeah, massive yeah, dunes, yeah. you know? So it's not really technical riding, um, but it's still sand and that saps fuel. Um, and I took, there's a funny story here because I was going to be in the desert because I filmed it. I could probably do it in a day. And everyone said, ah, oh, you can smash it out in a day, but I can't film it on my own and smash it out in a day because I have to stop, go back at the camera, you know, self-filming, it's quite hard. So I knew I was going to take two or three days. So I decided to take enough fuel to get across 505 miles, assuming a really poor fuel consumption. Really poor fuel consumption is about 30 miles to the gallon um, in, in our language. <laughs> um, and so I just worked out on that and I took... I got a 20 litre jerry can. So I had 32 in the bike. Mm -hmm. I had 20 litre jerry can and a 10 litre bladder, fuel bladder yeah. that I blagged off people on the road. So I just like, when I saw somebody, I asked them if I could buy it off them or whatever. So I had the 30 litres extra. Um, and I went across the Simpson Desert. I did all my filming and everything. And I took 12 litres of water. So I was like, it's four litres a day. Should be okay. Yeah. Um, it's pretty low, but it's like, you know, it's a, it's a backpack full of water plus my cooking on a night and stuff. So it should be okay. Did the Simpson desert crossing and I finished with about 17 liters of fuel and zero water. So it was like, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. And the reason for that is that it was, it was so easy going. I thought it was going to be really technical, but actually I got up to really good speeds, you know, like hundred kilometers an hour yeah. cruising along. And so I didn't use as much fuel, but I couldn't drink the petrol. So I was out of water by the time <laughs> I got up again. And the, and the other big one was the, um, the one in Angola. I mean, that was 700 miles or something. I say it in my video. Um, but that one, I basically filled the bike, um, took 20 liters on the bike, so two 10 liter containers. And then I had somebody dump another 20 liters after 20 liters had gone out of my bike, roughly. So I literally rode like till 20 liters had gone, found the fuel, dumped 20 liters in, chucked those bottles, put the other bottles on the bike and then carried on again. <laughs> um, so it was a bit of planning involved, but that was a lot. So that was, I would have needed 40 and 32, so 72 liters to do that. Yeah, okay. Which is obviously, you know, in terms of building a bike, that's a little bit unrealistic, isn't it? Yeah, you, you, so each, I think, I think 32 liters that I had on the bike 
was kind of like the maximum realistic amount you're going to put onto a bike. And I think if you've got that 400 mile, 600 kilometer range. That's more than enough for what I needed. Okay. There was only because I wanted to do those extreme things that I needed to, to, to carry more. Um, I think I never really ran out of fuel on my world trip. Well, I did, but only because of my own stupidity, not because of there not being a fuel station. You know, it's like I've done 300 miles. Oh, there's a gas station. I can't be bothered stopping yet. <laughs> Another one down the road, and then there isn't. You know, like just don't pass a gas station without. Um, so yeah, I would I would think nowadays with uh, the quite efficient, like especially now year five and year six engines that will be coming, they're so efficient. Mm. They've got to be efficient. Um, that probably like twenty two, twenty five liters mm. will be enough for most people. Yeah. Okay. So I think one of the more interesting things that you push is the simplicity of repair. And it's kind of a common theme amongst people that have kind of done quite serious adventure traveling and are capable of working on their own bike. Um, and you kind of made the point earlier that Basil is very specifically carbureted mm. when the 690 Enduro isn't. So is that kind of a must have for you that a bike to do what you've done has to be carbureted or would you travel, would you do it on something like a 790 that's EFI? Yeah. Um, I would absolutely do it on an EFI bike. Um, but if I went and did it again and I had the choice, I would take the same bike again okay, because yeah. it was so reliable and no issues at all. Um, you know, there's no ABS, there's no computers, there's no, I don't need a computer to do anything on that bike. Mm -hmm. Everything I can do myself. Here's the thing, you can be a really good, competent mechanic and take a new bike, and if something fails in the computer or the wiring or you've got a problem and you're in limp mode, you cannot do anything with it. Like, you've got to go find the dealer. Yeah. That's a massive inconvenience, but unfortunately, that's the way the modern bikes are going um, and they're not, and it's not going to change. So, you know, you have a choice. You either say, I've got to suck that up. Hopefully there won't be any problems because reliability is good. The, the manufacturers don't want there to be reliability problems, but inherently the complexity of the systems that they have to have on the bikes now increases the likelihood of reliability issues. So, um, you either take one of those modern production bikes because that's what you've got access to and it's what you want to ride. Let's face it as well. One important thing is what bike do you want to ride? Yeah. If you want to be seen on a 790 with a Red Bull graphics kit on it and a nav tower and a screen, then you're going to build that because that's your desire and, and you should do that. Um, but if you want something that's uber reliable, probably going to get you around the world with that, or on your four month adventure with no issues. Um, you, if, even if you're a good mechanic, you probably want something very simple and basic, like a DR650 or something like that, you know, yeah. so kind of old school. Obviously, a lot of your travels have taken you to quite different elevations. Um, mm. And so within that, did you keep the same carb settings? Or if you knew you were going to spend a week at 4,000 meters, did you change yeah. the carb settings? Because yeah. obviously, like my experience with the 450 rally is when yeah. you go to altitude, it runs like ass, like it's a terrible bike in compared to what it is when you're lower altitudes. It is if you don't jay it properly, the one. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. So here's, here's the thing, like I I did tweak my, my jetting a little bit at the start of my trip. Mm -hmm. But once I got it dialed, I had, a, I had a baseline that was good for everything. Okay. So in Peru, I, I rode all the way from North America to South America, through the mountains of Peru, 16,000 feet, didn't even touch it. Yeah. Not at all. And I've also had the, uh, this is a really good discussion. I like explaining it, so I'm going to go through it. <laughs> also, uh, I've had the experience of racing the Dakar on a 450 carbureted bike, which is what you did as well, and said it sucks ass at altitude. I also had the experience of racing a 450 EFI bike, and it also sucks ass at altitude. <laughs> and yeah. the, the, the reason for that is there is no oxygen at altitude. Yeah. You can't change that parameter. Mm -hmm. So people think miraculously through like internet talk typically yeah. that EFI is the answer to altitude problems with a motorcycle, but it's not. No, it just smooths it out happened. a tiny bit. Yeah. All that happens, and you have to take a scale. If I had a scale, I would use it. But uh, you take a scale, say the screen, yeah? So take the scale of the screen. You've got this, say you've got this much power, yeah, um, in a bike. 
When you go to altitude, let's say it's halved, because on a 450, it pretty much is halved at massive altitude, like 16,000 feet. Yeah. So your power is down to here, yeah? The only difference is on a fuel-injected bike, your power is also down to here. Exactly the same, because it's an oxygen thing. It's nothing to do with the fuel, yet. The only difference is that an EFI bike adjusts its fuel. So you end up losing, on an EFI bike, you don't lose any more due to poor fueling. And on a carburetor bike, you lose a tiny bit more. Did you see that? Yeah. A tiny bit more because of poor fueling. Yeah. So in actual fact, the difference between an EFI bike and a car bike is this, not this, which people think it is. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. And that, that's like my way of explaining it. Um, yes, you have to ride around it a little bit on a carburetor bike because the fueling issue, um, when especially when it's extremely rich at altitude, gives you some characteristics that you don't really like. Um, but it's never going to let you down and it's going to keep going if you've picked a baseline setting in mid altitude, which is what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, so it actually, it never, ever caused a problem. Uh, 16,500 feet below sea level, no problems. So um, always ran, um, yeah, no problem at all. So hopefully that explains to some people that yeah, don't no, awesome. know between EFI and carburation. Uh, the difference it actually makes. And I think if you did, if you ran some tests on a dyno, you would see that the percentage difference is quite small um, compared to what it is with an EFI bike. Cool. So if someone's looking to go down the route of building a smaller single cylinder bike, are you, are you kind of going to push them in the direction of starting with something like a 690 Enduro or a 701? Or are you kind of more along the lines of go and buy a 450, just put some small panniers on it and do what you want to do with it. Where, where do you, how do you kind of recommend? It's, it's a difficult one. And this is what I would put around it. So we know people have ridden around the world on EXCs. We know people have ridden around the world on 690s. We know people 701s and 1190s, 1200 GSs, anything. People have ridden around the world on a Cub 90, you know, Honda 90. You can do it the way you want to do it. It really is up to you. Um, So it's hard for me to say to anybody, this is the adventure bike you should take. Because I know if I got a Honda 90 and I just took off tomorrow for two weeks across Spain, I'd love it and I'd have a great fun time because I'm on two wheels and it's an adventure. And the bike breaks, I gotta find a garage and get the parts and fix it. That's what traveling is about. As long as you're happy on the bike that you're on and you can afford the bike you're on. Because the last thing you want is to get a mortgage for a bike (laughs) Um, and then be worrying about the payments on it, you know? Um, So it it really is a difficult topic, but all I would say is back to the weight thing and adding stuff to a bike. The 69701 chassis is much more capable of carrying weight than a 450-500 EXC, for example. Mm -hmm. So the EXC chassis is built for like off-road racing, and if you add weight on it, especially if you add weight on the back, it massively changes the handling characteristics of the bike. And that's something personally that I don't like because I know how a bike should handle. Whereas if you put luggage on a bigger bike, as you know with the big bikes like the 1190s and 950s, it does make a little difference, but it's not as much of a difference as on a small bike. So it's a little bit like the the discussion we've just had about the fuel injection. Uh, The more adding luggage to a smaller bike, uh, if you added the same weight luggage to a smaller bike, as a big bike, you would feel it much less on a big bike hmm. because the, compa- the the percentage of weight you're adding relative to the weight of the bike yeah. is not that much. So it's it's really down to preference and the user really has to think about these things because for me, I, I really dislike the EXC handling with weight on it. Um, and I remember once I had an Aprilia RX V450 and I put a huge like giant loop on the bag on the back and a roll bag on the top and it totally screwed up with the chassis that you could feel the flex in the chassis and all the weight was at the back. The front end went really like squirrely and light and I really disliked it. And that's when I realized that actually having the capacity to put weight up front as well to balance some of the weight at back and spring bike properly makes a big difference. So I think the smaller bike you go for, the less luggage you've got to take. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and that's reality, you know. You've got to take one pair of underpants, not ten. <laughs> that's a good question. How many pairs of underpants did you take? Yeah, and so I, as a rule, I tried to stick around four or five, and same with socks. Um, 
but I definitely wore them multiple days because I never washed every week. So like I I would probably go like three or four days, I'd say. And then like after a couple of weeks, I'd have a good wash session in a hostel or something. But I was uh, I was definitely a scrubber when I was out on the road. Yeah. Cool. So See, my own skids. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I imagine by this point you're you're probably pretty good at finding your way around as well. You've uh, you've been doing this for a little uh, a little bit of time, um, as well as using the Garmin Montana. How do you plan your routes? What kind of process do you go through, and what other equipment do you use? Yeah. So this uh, pl- route planning changed as I went along. At the very beginning, I was I was really naive about travel, overland travel. Uh, and adventure so I didn't really I'd done a lot of it you know but I'd always planned my trips um, and when when it becomes a lifestyle and you're traveling a lot it actually becomes quite exciting to not know what's tomorrow you know mm-hmm. just make it up um, and so what I did when I started my trip I always planned so the first six months of my trip I got help from um, Walter Colback who helped me to plan the trip across Asia because he's got lots of experience, the Sabersky Extreme guy. Um, and, and that was great. But as soon as that had expired, I was in North Korea, uh, sorry, South Korea. And I didn't know anyone or know anyone that had traveled down South Korea. So straight away, I was just traveling every day going, oh, maybe I'll go over to those mountains and see what's over there and have a ride around. And I started making it up and I really liked that. So actually what happens is if you plan too much ahead, I found that, and especially route planning, and then something gets in your way or you don't make a border crossing at the right time or, you know, you meet someone and you can't stop because you've booked a ferry three days ahead. I just rocked up at everything. Ferries, like I just made it up as I went along. And that, that really, really helped to make my trip exciting and go into the unknown um, in a com- couple of times where I didn't want it to go, but it's, uh, it's part of it. And, uh, yeah, so I used the Montana for the whole trip. I think now technology is changing a lot and, uh, you know, the Montana, I think I had three or something in the whole trip, 250,000 kilometers and about three or four devices cause they just vibrated to bits. But, um, I think technology is changing a lot and I've seen a couple of people traveling with um, like iPads on the hand, you know, iPads on the handlebars and stuff like that. And honestly, with the technology in the iPhone now, if I was to go traveling again, I'd probably get a rugged iPhone mount and I'd just use my phone. So good offline maps. It's just everything's there. What I would do towards the end of my trip, so through Africa, I would literally get my phone out. I'd go on Google Maps. I love like mountains and interesting geographical features. So I'd just go onto Google Maps, satellite view, zoom out, find where the mountains are or what looks decent, a lake or something interesting. And then I'd just think, oh, that looks cool. I wonder if there's any roads there. There's no roads there. Oh, there's a track there. And I'd just like pick a route of three, 500 kilometers in a day and just go explore. Mm-hmm. And if I didn't find anywhere that night, I'd stop, cook my own dinner and camp out. And if I did find somewhere, I'd stop there. You know, it was just random and i really enjoyed that so i was using google maps anyway when i was in a built-up area when i had connection and then as soon as you get out of the wilderness you just use google maps offline um and you navigate your way around and it's it's awesome fun so i think we're definitely going to see a change in that in the future where we're going to see um sort of tablet based screens and navigation devices on bikes and i think that's no different for adventure bikes you know we're already being asked to put them on our adventure bikes so um, I think that's just the way it's going. Cool. So, um, with that kind of more navig, uh, more exploratory approach, have you ever got yourself into a situation where like technically you didn't know how to get out of it, where you were sat at the bottom of a hill and you're like, dude, I'm like, I'm in a bad place here. Yeah. Well, there was, there's a couple of places and those that watch races to places, the series will have seen these on video. Um, one really bad one that springs to mind was when I was with two other riders. So it was actually three of us. And I'm really glad there was because there was no way I'd have got out of it without them. So we were going down a path following Google Maps, uh, what was marked as a road. It was steep downhill, grassy, muddy, but it was a track, you know. So we just kept going, kept going. It got steeper, narrower, tighter and tighter to the point where it was like, I ain't taking my bike down there. And like, it takes a lot for me to say that. Uh, I was first and I was like, it's too much. I don't know where this is going and it's too much. So we took a walk and we hiked down 
right, about another mile. And we're really glad that we didn't because it just went into this horrible, rocky gully. Um, and so basically we turned around and we had to pull the bikes all the way out. So it took us about 18 hours to do about 12 kilometers. Uh, and that was the, probably one of the worst days on most places, <laughs> energy burn point of view. Um, and the other one that sticks in my mind was in Thailand. There's a bit in Thailand where there's some really great exploring in the north of Thailand and in the northwest. Uh-huh. And then in the east and down the east coast, it's well populated. And I wanted to get back to the coast, but I didn't want to ride all the way back around where I'd just come from. So I tried to straight line through the jungle. And somebody told me that it was possible and it had been done on an enduro bike. So I was just like, I can do this. So I loaded up, got the fuel, figured it out, had a bit of an idea where the tracks went, and I had it off. And I kept pushing and pushing and pushing through the trees and the and rivers, river crossings, and trying to find the tracks, petered out, found it again. And then I just, I was so exhausted from crossing all these steep river beds and everything. And every time you go into something in a situation like that, you've got to think, am I going to be able to get back out of it? If I drop into this river, and ride across the river and get out of the other side. Can I drop back into the river and get back out of the river bank at this side? There was a couple of sketchy ones that I thought, I could probably do it, but we'll have to wait and see. But I'll keep pushing on. But then I came to this massive tree that had fallen down. Like, it was a huge. It was like three foot diameter. And if I was on an enduro bike, no problem. You know, pop the front wheel up onto it. But on a big, heavy loaded adventure bike, I put the front wheel up onto it, got the bash plate onto it, Tried to lift the bike over, but bearing in mind it was 45 degrees, 100% humidity. It was like ridiculously retarded conditions. I broke down, man. I properly broke down. First time, big time on the trip. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't have enough food with me and I didn't have enough water with me to get through there. And I, and I said, shit, I'm going to have to go back. I'm going to have to go back. And I, and I really reluctantly turned around and, you know, went back and got stuck in the river, couldn't get back out, had to take all my luggage off. It's a, When you see the video, I'm just covered in mud. The bags are strewn all over the place, um, but I made it out, you know, just like. Um, so those are the two moments that stick in my mind. The stress is real. The stress yeah. is real. Yeah, I've definitely had a few like that along the way. <laughs> well, that's the end of my questions. So um, I've got a few reader questions here as well. Um, cool. So the first one is from Ridey Bikes Moto. Um, yeah. And he says, for those of us that can't source a full 690 RFR, what are your yeah. thoughts on the benefits and pitfalls of swapping out the frame to a, to the 690 rally frame? You, does he mean from a 690 Enduro? Yeah, I think so, yeah. It's it's really not worth it. Um, unless you want the, the benefits of the extra travel suspension, uh, the biggest difference between the frame on the 690 Enduro and the 690 Rally is that it fits a longer shock. So the upper shock mount is stronger and it also fits a longer shock so you can have the full travel, 320 millimeters. Um, geometry and strength of the frame is more or less the same other than there's a lot of bracketry that's different. I make some additional components which wouldn't be on a 690 RFI if you bought it to strengthen it. Um, we strengthen the bits that are weak spots on the 690 Enduro, uh, and also the, the linkage and stuff on the suspension is very different, linkage and swing arm. So if, you, if I had a 690 Enduro, would I put a 690 Rally frame on it? No. Would I put my frame on it with 690 Rally suspension? Yes, and we've actually done two of those conversions for customers. Okay, with so, the standard 690. Yeah. Well, we, basically, we basically took the standard 690 frame mm -hmm. and modified it to a rally spec frame with the upgrades uh, and then put the long travel suspension in it. Okay. But now we have a solution for the standard 690 Enduro to put 320 millimeter suspension in it. Yeah. So we have our own shock now, which converts it. Very good. Okay. So uh, how well did Enduro riding and rally moto events, so that's the UK kind of rally series, how well did those prepare you for desert racing? Was Enduro riding better? Was, desert, was the rally riding better? Massively, because the biggest thing about those events were, and they were great, the guys that put those events on, I think of... Uh, I think Robert Hughes, uh, Mark Molyneux, you know, those guys that helped to put that together, 
awesome because it was a really great series and I'm sure there's still some stuff going on in the UK but I'm just not there but um, they were great and the fact that I did them on the big bike like the big bike rally challenge the terrain like I remember tearing through Kielder Forest on these like slippery tree rooted <laughs> tracks on the big bike it was hairy yeah? it was serious like you really had to have some technical ability to ride fast in that sort of stuff mm-hmm. um so i did it first on the 950 and then i got the 450 rally and did the same again because i didn't have any money to go and do like rally raids so definitely helped a lot it was a huge part of like my training for dakar was doing those uk rally events on a big bike mm-hmm. because if if an event might seem too easy and flowing Put yourself on a bigger bike. It gets a lot <laughs> yeah, for and sure. That's really great for riding a rally bike. You know, if you can ride a 950, a big bike, uh, 1190, you know, 800 GS, anything, a big bike, now 10 or 790, through that terrain at a decent pace, you can ride a rally bike through the Dakar. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe there's some technical bits that you'd struggle in, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's it very much does prepare you for it. Um, so next question: uh, Would you like the Dakar to bring back big bikes again, or do you think the 450 is the best choice? Both. I I actually do think the 450 is the best choice, but I would also like to see the big bikes come back. The one thing that I like about the Africa Eco Race, and both, there's a whole, I, th- I think I've done a, oh no, I'm about to release a video about the differences between Dakar and the Africa Eco Race. So that's going to come out in the next, I don't know, probably a few weeks. Yeah. It's just finished editing it. But it compares some of the awesome bits about Dakar and the awesome bits about the Africa Race and how they differ. Um, both really great events. But the one good thing I like about the Africa Race is that they allow the big bikes um and it was really good to see like 790s racing there uh, and stuff like that but also what you see now is that like those big bikes they didn't do that well because the development on the smaller bikes and people realizing that the smaller bikes the way to go uh, they're actually doing better they've got higher speeds they've got you know better handling and so although we still see them at the rally would they come back competitively? I don't ever think so now. I think, that, you know, the 450 has got more than enough power. I mean, it does 175 down the beach at Dakar, 176 kilometers an hour, like on a on a sand. And that was, like, and your one's, is, is your engine stock as well? Yes. Yeah. So production. A few, few minor changes to the fuel injection and stuff like that, but pretty much stock engine. Yeah. I mean. It's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, you don't want to be going much faster than that. Uh, and, okay, what, what's that? That's like uh, 110 miles an hour. It's it hard to see at 110 miles an hour off-road, though. <laughs> I'm at 50 because of the weight. I remember going down the beach flat out on that thing, and I think with the weight and everything, I don't think that did much more than 120 mm-hmm. down the beach flat out. You know, it's a lot heavier. It sinks in the sand more. So there's actually no, I don't think there's a benefit to a bigger bike. I think 450 is the right size for the Dakar. I'd actually be more interested in this, like a 250 class. Yeah. You'll say that until you've raced a 250 in a rally. It's a painful experience. (laughs) (laughs) That's the biggest crash of my entire life was racing a 250 in a rally. Yeah. Yeah. The The only thing with the 250 is to make them... They're really highly strung anyway. Yeah, they are, and to yeah. make them reliable over that distance yeah. is, is, is again, you're getting into big money. So it's like it's like Formula One rec- reducing the size of the engine, and then they have to spend more money to make it possible to produce the same power. Mm-hmm. Um, 450, they've got about right, and I really like it. I mean, there's talk of them reducing the power and reducing the intake restrictions and stuff on them. So I don't know where it's going to go that, but um, both is the answer to that question. I like the 450. <laughs> Of all, if I was to race the Dakar or the Africa race again, I'd race a 450. And, it's the right bike to do that rally on and, any of those places. And the newest generation one over the previous so ones. You just get better all the time. <laughs> they really, they really do get better all the time. The new bike's amazing. Yeah, I mean, right. It's spectacular. Really good. Um, so yeah, and but also, you know, I kind of like seeing the 790 there, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, it's got a certain sound and a feel to it. And it's a big bike, and uh, you know, yeah, I, I would, I'd actually like to race a big bike in a desert in a 950 or something in a race like that. 
but there's just no need now. Yeah, yeah. Like it's it's more dangerous for sure at those speeds. I mean, if you crash on a big heavy bike, I've always had. Okay, you're an exception, Llewellyn, because you had a big crash on a 250. <laughs> Yeah. Me personally, I've had the biggest crashes on the big bikes. Yeah, for yeah. sure, but crashing a rally bike is like a scary experience. They uh, they don't crash well. No, no, no. Um, so turning left a little bit. Um, so much of the world rides like really small bikes, like one fifties. You've been to Asia, and everybody rides around on one two fives, two hundreds. These crappy little bikes in the middle of nowhere. So if you were going to take one of those and make a dual sport out of it, what would be the first thing you'd change? So we just repeat the beginning of that question again. So uh, with, if you were going to take a 150cc, like a crappy yep. Asian bike, or, yeah. what would you change on it to make it good for kind of travel riding? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to say anything, right? No. Uh, honestly, like, there's, I think there's a lot of fun in doing something like that, like going to Vietnam, buying a pit bike 150 and go traveling around Vietnam. I mean, the, the two things that, come straight to my head that would be weak points for me is the kind of crappy Chinese engine that you're constantly having to change cams and bearings and crap. Like there's some better engines out there for them and the suspension sucks. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so it, yeah, maybe taking your bag with you, like a, a decent engine build for one and some suspension and then just buy a one with a blown engine. Yeah. And, swap the motor out put the suspension in and i think you'd have some really good fun for quite a few months on something like that yeah cool um so this is a really technical question from um my friend simon hewitt who's watching uh he raced Dakar this year and unfortunately his engine went bang um yeah. so he says uh what oil viscosity would you run in cold temperatures combined with like high revs in the dunes because that i think they had a lot of that this year it was real cold even though they were riding in the sand dunes yeah, 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 yeah. Well, when it's a really good question, and you see the oil manufacturers all going to a wider spread. So they've got like a, a lower viscosity when they're cold, so like the first number. So there's like on the oil, there's the, the initial number, which is the cold temperature, and then the W and the upper number, which is how, how the oil behaves at a hotter temperature. So there's the lower temperature, hot temperature. There's a lot of uh, manufacturers now trying to push the boundaries so they're pushing down to a 1060 as we see a lot of people using especially in competition and even like 570 although we haven't seen them yet they've been about here and there 560s you know stuff like that so um they're always trying to push it to cover the biggest range of scenarios you know because the upper number doesn't really matter too much at the cold temperature so the startup temperature in the morning, it's important to have an oil that's not too viscous. So if you had an engine that said you need anything from a five weight to a 10 weight for temperatures at minus 10 C, you don't want a 20 weight oil in your engine yeah, okay. because it can't pump through the jets and get to the point that it needs to be at. Mm -hmm. Oppositely, at the upper end of the scale, um, you know, they recommend in the KTMs to run 1060, I think it is 1060 or 1050 some models like the EXCs. Um, but like 1050, 1060, and that's because the oil behaves like a 60 weight oil at temperature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it behaves like a thicker oil at that temperature. Yeah. And the, the lower number behaves like a thinner oil at the cold temperature. So it behaves like a 10 at the cold temperature. Yeah. Um, so you've got these oils that even at temperature, they don't go as thin. They don't degrade as much. Yeah. yeah. So the question from Simon was like in the, you've got cold temperatures in the desert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you, the, when you go in really fast in those cold temperatures and you've got an oil cooler, yeah, your oil is cooling down more. Yeah. yeah? yeah, yeah. So it's getting more viscous. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, that's where you want to be thinking about which oil you actually want. You, you, you want one that behaves a little bit, uh, thinner because the temperature is cooler yeah, yeah. so you want one that behaves a little bit thinner at that temperature so, you, so that's where you need to think about what am i doing with the bike and is it important now you know i know the factory teams they use 1050 in the bike but the recommendation is to use a 1060 um very small difference between those and if you think about oil temperature in your bike in the dakar for example when you full song like and that oil's whizzing around the engine even with an oil cooler, it's hot. Yeah, yeah. You know? 
100 yeah. degrees so really. The, the outside temperature does make a difference, but it's not that great. Mm -hmm. um, so I really don't think that uh, having a cold temperature outside racing, like he was experiencing, has an impact on okay. an engine mm -hmm. at, at that level. You know, um, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but uh, I think the temperature variation that you're talking about by you know, having an oil cooler running in cold temperatures, when you're racing, you're pretty much on song, you know, and the oil temperature is going to be hot. Mm. Uh, I think if you stopped and checked the oil temperature, I'd be surprised if the difference was that great to warrant changing grades. So, uh, cool. Um, along that same line of rally racing, how did you kind of get clued up on reading road books? Did you have any start help at the start or did you kind of just figure it out yourself? Yeah, it's a funny story, this one. Um, I literally had never ridden or ridden or rode or seen a road book in my life. And I signed up for the 2012 FIM World Cross Country Championship in Sardinia. And I turned up at the start line. I got my road book at the first day and I marked all the road book how I thought you should mark it. You know, probably researched a little bit, watched some of Cyril de Prey's videos on how to mark a road book. That was it. Um, and then what I did is I made the mistake, common mistake that most people make when they go into rallying. They think they're a really fast rider and they probably are on a motocross track or an enduro bike or out adventure riding with the mates following a GPS. You're super fast. But when you do rallying, number one thing is you can only ride as fast as you can navigate because if you don't, you're going to go the wrong way and that's slower than anything else. <laughs> so you're better off just slowing down navigating well than going fast and getting lost in my opinion so i i went fast for two days and got lost a lot and then i realized in my head that actually i'm a good rider and i can ride really fast but i can't ride really fast and navigate at the same time so what i need to do is slow down navigate learn to navigate fast and then ride fast and that's where the alien comes in those factory riders they are legitimate at navigating well keeping on top of the road book and keeping it pinned the whole time yeah. and i know that even even though i'm pretty fast um you know i had a top 10 stage finish on dakar finished the eco race third overall even though i'm pretty fast like i know i can't i know i'm closing the throttle yeah. to make sure i'm navigating well so I, I still hold my hand up to close in the throttle when I look at my onboard and I'm like, get on the gas, Lyndon. But I can't because I'm making sure I'm going in the right place. Mm. Those guys never shut off. No, <laughs> they just hang in the wire tight the whole time. Um, and that's where I would need to do more. And that's why the factory riders are paid to do that mm -hmm. because they train, they road book ride all the time. Training, 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 and that's what you need to be fast on a rally bike. You need to navigate and ride well. I, there was a, I can't remember whose podcast it was. It might have been the Zach Osborne one, but he interviewed uh -huh. Andrew Short and he said uh, at the start of his rally riding career, he couldn't believe how much those guys were hitting stuff blind and just <sighs> commit the commitment was out of this world, how much they'd go off the backside of a dune wide open or just not roll off on a dirt road because it'll be uh -huh. all right. And yeah. And I think that brings up a really interesting point because look, rally, when Rally changed to the 450 engine, it definitely got safer. You know, we saw the number of deaths and serious injuries reduce mm. because the speed and the weight of the bike was reduced. Um, you know, so the handling characteristics improved, um, less crashes, less injuries, stuff like that. Um, what's also happened though is that the, the, the competition has gone up as well. So, you know, you've got to be a legitimate rider to finish the top 30 at Dakar. Yeah. You've got to be legit, yeah, like, yeah. because the competition's high. Um, but what that's done is that's p pushed in risk taking. So in the top 10 now, the risks that those guys have to take are massive. Mm -hmm. And that's why we see big crashes. Look at Bavarian's crash, at Dak, Van Bavarian's crash. Whoa, yeah. so big. And because those guys are just holding it, mm -hmm. you know? And the thing is as well, if the, we're going to these road books where they're mar pre-marked now mm -hmm. and you get them in the morning, you don't have a chance to look through them or anything. If one person miss, the people writing the road book miss 
something. Or I think one of the biggest issues we're seeing is that they're pre-running and setting up the roadbooks in cars yeah. at like 40 or 60 kilometers an hour. Mm-hmm. It's completely different when you hit it at 140 kilometers an hour in a bike. Mm-hmm. So what looks like it's not too much and might just be a single caution in a road book, so we would just keep it pinned, it might actually be double and throw you off the bike. Mm. And when you're doing those speeds, it's dangerous. And you have to put a lot of trust in your road book on rally riding. And you know, the road book at the road book at all the Dakars that I did and the Africa Rico race were amazingly good. Mm-hmm. Really good. Um, so I bet you've done some rallies where that wasn't the case though, where the road book was turn left when you should have turned right. Definitely done some. I remember, uh, 2000 and 2016 Sonora rally in, uh, in America. Um, it, there's no real, the, the organization after the fact knew why it was like that, but basically they didn't pre run the last stage. So they didn't, at the rally time. Mm -hmm. So nobody ran through the stage to make sure it was okay. So there was this flat fence line and I'm like pinned down this fence line, fast, fourth, fifth gear on Basel bike, on the big bike, yeah? And then there's there's like a double caution, massive washout. I mean, I hit that thing so hard, went off into the trees. If there was a tree, I'd have been gone. And I made my way through the trees like, amazingly got back on track managed to get back on and thought okay this happens sometimes you know maybe i missed it in the road book but let's get on with it got back on again and the same thing again and i just said you know what that's it and then i remember getting to the end of the stage and saying like that was scary stage you know um because you could only ride then what you see so you have to slow down a lot um and the organizers actually held their hand up and said you know that will not happen again uh noted and it definitely won't happen again and i've heard really great things about future rallies so i'm sure this has got that sorted out cool so uh one other question to do with rally riding um if someone's engaging in their first rally would you recommend just going with a super simple kind of enduro cup style bike where it's a road book mounted on the handlebars or should they go ahead and build a bike with a full fairing and so on <laughs> My, my advice would be, if you're not sure where you want to go and you just want to have a dabble in rally riding, um, stick a road book on a 450 or something, or even a 350, whatever you've got, stick a road book on it and go and do a road book mm. rally. See how you get on. Don't spend any money. Just go and do a rally. Hellas rally. Great little rally. Not expensive. Super fun terrain. Suited to an enduro bike. That's it. If you think you want to do Dakar, and you think you've got what it takes because you're an extremely good adventure rider, you race enduro, you're fit and strong, you ride well, and you decided, I want to do Dakar in the next two or three years, get yourself a factory rally bike straight away. Because use it, learn it, get experience on it, uh, and it will pay dividends in the end. You'll know it inside out, mechanically, electrically. You'll know how it works. You'll know how it handles. you know how to adjust things on it. Uh, and that's that's definitely the most reliable and best way to go for big rallies. So Africa race, Dakar rally, world championship cross-country races. Um, and even if you've got the money for smaller rallies. Mm-hmm. But I think if you just want to have a go, just use what you've got. Stick a road book on it, an Ico trip computer, and go and have some fun. Uh, and I've just I've just got one here actually, just behind me. Um, it's just a really simple setup for my enduro bike here. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna put it on my 300 two stroke. Yeah. You know, make some road books locally and just go and have fun. Yeah. Uh, it really, as long as you're out there having fun riding bikes, that's what we all want to do. Awesome. Know? So I think we're probably at about time there, hour and ten minutes. Um, cool. Yeah. So. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Um, it's been good fun. Some good questions. Thank you for thank you for hosting it and uh, dreaming up some questions. It's uh, it's hard for me to talk about different topics, so it's good when somebody else asks the questions. So thanks for doing that, Well, No problem. Um, yeah, for my listeners that watch this, tell tell people what you've kind of got going on and what you do on your Patreon. Yeah, and same for me. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of. Uh, Lots of Patreons watching this. It was kind of cool to do something together with you um, because we've both got our own Patreon channels. um, So we agreed to do it jointly and uh, hopefully both both followers enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. so I think you quite regularly do live streams um, on yours and kind of Q&As with your Patreons and you put out on a regular basis uh, future videos that don't get shown onto 
onto YouTube. Yeah. I think you said it's 10 weeks, is it, between... So basically my travel series, Races to Places, uh, if you sign up on Patreon, it's 10 weeks ahead. So you get 10 more episodes than the public. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also get interaction from me. So you can speak directly to me on there um, in Messenger or however you want to do it. It's a much easier way to contact me because there's obviously less people on there than social media where there's like 60, 70,000 on each platform. Um, so Patreon is really good for that, for communication and messaging. Um, so you get that. And I also do special features. So the one that I released in just because of this COVID lockdown, I released the Basil bike one, uh, and it's really popular. Everyone loves it. That's been on Patreon for over a year. So there's special features on there that I've done, uh, which are not ever going to be out in the public. So there's a live stream on there that's just purely for Patreons. So, uh, Thank you to all my patrons for subscribing, and uh, they they really what keep the wheels turning for us. Yeah, so. the same for us. It makes a huge difference. Um, and if you like this podcast, this is something we do twice a month. Um, we sit down yeah. with people and ask them questions about things that we don't know about. So yeah, yeah. if you're into that, yeah. come and say hey. And um, otherwise, yeah. yeah. Thanks very much for uh, your time, Lyndon. It's been awesome. Cool. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Cheers.